Okay, so I'm reading um, this evening from a selected that was published uh, recently by Spite and Dival Press in um, New York City, and it's um, it's roughly eight books, I think, and then um, for um, my brilliant um, wife, Carol Goodman, Hammond Prize-winning novelist and um, author of many novels. Uh, I, I have had the good fortune to write poems for eight or nine of them, I think, which are also in the book. And then we also wrote three novels together um, called, well, the Black Swan, Swan Rising trilogy, and um, that was a few years ago. But So we also have poems in those books. Um, you know, my character who was really the character that most of my writing went into will use um, is a vampire hedge fund manager who uh, sort of cut his teeth on the early uh, 17th century turbulence and learned a lot. And he is um, also a poet. <laughs> who, would have, who would have thought? So I wrote some poems from Willie Hughes's point of view. And um, so I'm, what, what I was trying to say is that I'm going to read one poem from each of these entries in the book. You know, I just truck, uh, pick samples. Um, you know, I learned a little bit from doing that. I mean, the themes, uh, some of my themes, which include paleontology, you know, the ancient world, and also personifying nature, they really go back to the beginning, as you can see from the two poems that I read from the first two books. So uh, let me begin there. And uh, the other themes come out. It was 2002 when I found a historical connection between Pythagoras' interest in numbers and who he really was, which was not a mathematician at all. He was a social and philosophical leader who played an important uh, political role in Magna Graecia in the early uh, to mid, uh, excuse me, the mid to late 6th century BC, and who by modern terms was a total progressive. He emancipated slavery, uh, so the slaves, and uh, also emancipated women. But I'll get to that more in a minute. Um, but let me actually stop myself here and say that I'm also very proud to be reading with Ginger Zamus, who has a kind of parallel or similar historical um, anchor in another brilliant philosopher, uh, Heraclitus, and whose you know work I really have found very. Uh, I mean, it's, it's great work, but also that that parallel has intrigued me for quite for probably four or five years now. Okay, so. This is from uh, Ghost Along the Hudson, which was published in 1996, and it's called Dragonfly. Form frozen in a past 300 million years old, and yet as modern as this flaming square of sunlight, bursting from behind a cloud and startling her into flight. Now she's etched in gold pool light, darting towards some prey, and in her blue-black eyes reflects the ancient relentlessness with which she devoured time. She soars aloft with captured gnat, eluding arrows of sun, form outlined against the crest of an earth, turning, turning. Okay, so then my first book, uh, first full-length book, uh, Coast Along the Hudson was a chapbook. So that's 2002. And um, that's called Talk Between Leaf and Skin. So I'm going to read um, a poem called The Language of Trees from that book. <clears throat> you told me trees could speak, and the only reason one heard silence in the forest was that they all had been born knowing different languages. That night I went in the woods to bury dictionaries under roots. So many books in so many tongues as to ensure speech. And now this very moment the forest seems alive. With whispers and murmurs and rumblings of sound, wind rushed into my ears. I do not speak any language that crosses the silence around me. But how soothing instead to know that the yearning and grasping embodied in trees convoluted and startling shapes is finally being fulfilled in their wind shouts to each other. Yet we who both speak English and have since we were born are moving ever farther apart, even <coughs> as brand 
bench tips touch. Okay, my, my second full length book, um, which was turned out to be somewhat ironically titled, um, I'll just say a couple of things about the title. But, um, well, the title's Money and Light. And uh, that, it's actually named after a poem in the book. I mean, the title makes no sense in terms of the content of the um, book. But what was interesting about it was that um, when the book went to press, I mean, the publisher went bankrupt like the next day. And, and it, it was like, it's my second book, but it's actually published years after my third one. So I got the idea not, you know, don't use money again in the title. <laughs> Uh, and I don't know what money has to do with life. At the time, my mother told me it was the worst title she'd ever heard. And, and you know, I can't even find the phone now, so... Um, I'll read another one if I can. But let me just... Okay, I found it. It's called Gecko, which um, I'm sure most of you know is a very small lizard that actually can walk on molecules. So molecules seem theoretical. Abstract conceits, small art of microscope, maybe mirages like quarks, isotopes, rule over facts by the conceptual. But not so on the gecko's tiny beat, in which it climbs up walls so casually. Infinitesimal hairs on its blur feet can wrap around molecules relentlessly. Three feet a second is its rate of climb, or quickness crossing ceilings belly up. It's doctored in physics straight from time, vast, immemorial, that's conjured up such huge capacity for tread and flight as to bring molecules almost in sight. Okay, so a few years after that, uh, my third book, uh, well, yeah, third book, terms of when I sent in the poem um, was Pythagoras and Love. Now I will say just anecdotally, actually um, this is probably a total non sequitur, but last Monday in New York, Carol and I went to an event called Poets Walk, which is a bunch of poets, uh, actually it was thousands of people. Um, or tens of thousands crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. It was a very great event, but I was reminded in the introduction the question of what is the meaning of poetry. So the two MCs were um, Billy Collins, uh, who's a poet, and uh, Bill Murray, who's a well-known American actor. And um, you know, I probably didn't say this right away because I'm not sure I'm remembering what he said exactly right. But um, what Bill Murray said about the meaning of poetry, sort of indirectly, was. Um, and now that he was a published poet, uh, he was putting on weight. And he sort of ran his hand around his midriff, and you know, everyone was laughing uproariously. And then he said, and then if you have two poems published, then you, you get really fat. So um, I'm telling this story for really no reason, except, you know, it's, it's pontification on the um, struggles of being a poet. And, um, you know, I, I was very, I mean, Bill Murray was, I mean, I guess he's kind of a celebrity who's interested in poetry, but he read uh, poems by, um, you know, some prominent poets. Um, I mean, he was an unbelievable reader. I mean, he read these poems like he'd spend, you know, his entire life in academia or whatever, so. Uh, and it struck me, you know, and again, getting back to the introduction, that poetry is extremely meaningful for the individuals who write it, and also, you know, to, to the individuals who listen to it, it's sort of like with any art form. I mean, it's very hard to say exactly what the, what the meaning of it is, but um, I did feel like um, Bill Murray gave a kind of humorous take on that question. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read actually from Pythagoras and Love. I'm going to read, uh, read, it's a, a sonnet sequence of 46, and I'm going to read two. Obviously, they're all pretty short. This one is called Reassured by a Hawk. Vicissitudes of cloud have broken rain and lightning over every inch of path. Though now the slosh of puddle faintly gleams in sun-split respite 
and placid silence soothes some spare survivors. Thunder flattened leaves, still gasping for green air off slashed branches. Sundered trunks of oaks are everywhere. He looks but can't believe the victory of Severn in these woods, presided over now by vacant sky and muted trill of lark. Such rule by chance sent fury frightens. Theorems disappear to chaos in a world of garbled ruins. He's frantic for some order. Hawk ascends, then traces perfect circles based on pi. Uh, and then, from the same book, um, the sonnet is called Burial of the Sun. What hieroglyphs, trees, leafy shadows form upon a meadow glass bright with the gold demands of sinking sun upon the warm blue remnants of a summer day grow old. Pythagoras can calculate how long before the sun enters itself once more. The angled math of shadows never wrong, and neither is hypotenuse of sore. Triangulation by ascending hawk whose broad wing glide appears to climb the light, but how to measure on his evening walk the loss of his brief days to endless night. A final gleam of bronze enshrines this day. He ponders brevity, goes on his way. Okay, the next poem, which is called um, Seaside Ben Sorrento, uh, is written at an Italian location. Italy is the historical birthplace of the sonnet, all the way back, um, I think it's around 1230, uh, on what is now um, Sicily. I mean, it was the Holy Roman Empire, it was the court of the Holy Roman Empire, and a bookkeeper slash accountant uh, named Giacomo Dallantini fell in love with someone of a higher social class and supposedly expressed his feelings this way because he was not allowed to talk to her you know, in terms of the social mores of the time. And actually the poem I'm about to read is, um, um, well, I will um, not really introduce it, but I want to use it actually um, to plug my wife's new book, because, um, <laughs> which is um, The Widow's House, it was just published in March, and it ha in the book are six lines from this poem. So, if I was truly mischievous, I'd ask people to um, guess which six, but it might not be so easy to do. So, to find out, you really will have to get the book, which is on sale, on sale everywhere. So, unlike my books. <laughs> Seaside Beach Sorrento. When Wilhelmina F. Jashemsky found Vesuvius had outlined some ghost roots, Trees beneath the lava sheeted ground, empty spaces traced with pebbles, missing truths of leaf and bark, species were brought to light. Her plaster cast could resurrect the dead, at least as sculpture, art. And now the flight of seahawks hints at pterodactyl blood, while ancient sunlight shivers on the bay, and our thoughts turn to love, which if it lasts a year, will flirt with immortality. Vesuvius has nothing new to say. Hey, shrouded, calm. This all goes by so fast. There's more than one kind of catastrophe. Many people over the years have asked me what that last line means. Um, I actually kind of thought I had an answer to it this afternoon, um, finally. But um, I probably should not say it except that one of the catastrophes referred to in that line is Vesuvius. So that's sort of the basic logic. <laughs> um, OK, so we're in the home stretch now, but um, my voice is holding up, as hopefully you agree. Uh, so my next book, which is 2014, is I published a flurry of books in recent years. I mean, I have a publisher who uh, is willing to put them out, and um, you know, uh, I, I, every morning, my work routine is to, is to walk in the, uh, in the, well, in the foothills of a mountain in Woodstock, New York, <clears throat> and try to write a poem. 
you know, I don't go out in the morning looking at sort of, you know, stock market quotes. So, you know, sometimes I get some luck, and so I, but I really try to write a poem every day. I mean, that does, I don't, maybe I write two a week, but I try. So this is why there are more books now. And this poem is called The Craft of Wind. I have a name, a face, a date of birth, but all I really am is molecules. The craft of wind and atoms, art of earth. I'll vanish like sunlight on darkening seas, a momentary swirl, a figment of breeze. Yes, I wish I had more core, <clears throat> but I am flux. It's shimmer, evanescence, that truly rule. Their nature constant shift, unruly mix of here and gone forever. Crow at noon, a midnight sun, the sway of trees, a slash of hawks toward prey, cold lake at dawn, the ash of last night's fire. Someday I'll rearrange my atoms into a fish or a bird, a change of course, but not entirely my ruin. So the last two here are from the new book, actually, which has some new poem. <coughs> no, correct. Well, it has a section of uh, some new poems, the last section. Um, and the first one is called, He's Gone a Decade. Well, I guess I'm not sipping any water. <laughs> what are there? Oh, yeah, thank you. I'm not sure. This poem, <coughs> excuse me, this poem starts with a quote that is eight lines long. To multiply all leaves by clouds, then wind, is beautiful and accurate. It gives a unity to chaos. Math begins in small details, flights angle, length of waves, and royal Fijian waters. Theorems prove not only ratios, but numbers love for breeze-blown shimmer, water splash, bees buzz, the way fierce hawks climb light, end quote. Pythagoras had said all this 10 years ago. Apollo knows these words by heart and now alone. He says them to a tree, a rock, his abacus, then finds a newer audience. Some crows are nodding yes from one gnarled branch. They seem to love such thoughts. Their night black feathers gleam. So I'll close with this poem uh, from my own books, and then I have just two more to read from collaborations with Carol, really, in one way or another. Uh, this poem is called Chandler's Los Angeles. The pool's out back, the slender butler says, and that is where you'll find Senor. And sure enough, he is dozing. A mild blue breeze stirs tiny ripples from the fans of the leaves. Not far away, a warbler chorus sings. You're not Philip Marlowe, but you'd love to be. Hello, you say, as you approach and note his hat, pulled low despite thick blonde curls. Uh-oh, you think, because one cheek is smeared with red, and then you tug his hat up, black and crimson whole, quite dead. A hard-boiled guy should never overreact. You pull his hat back down, look at the sky, Inscrutable, slow haze, you'll need more facts. Back to the butler now, he might know why. Okay, so um, the last, the next last poem, which is called Humble Adams, is from the middle of the three Black Swan Rising books, which is called The Watchtower. 
And this is a poem uh, written by Will Hughes. Um, I don't really think you need more plot than that, probably. But he's addressing it to his great love, uh, whose name is Marguerite. In, in addition to being a hedge fund manager and a vampire <laughs> and a poet, I forgot to mention that Will Hughes is also the young man of Shakespeare's son. So that, that search for uncertainty is now over. But I, I have not aggressively pushed the... Um, you know, I haven't aggressively pushed this thesis, although the New York Times did print a letter I wrote about the first book concerning a water tunnel in Manhattan that was neglected you know, for 200 years by the city uh, on the thesis that the reason for the neglect was the neighborhood it was in, which is, they did print that letter, but I think the young man might be more controversial. Um, anyway, Humble Adams. I've learned that love's perfection isn't time or anything that can be measured. No, it's merged beyond all comprehension, rhyme between two hearts and minds. A river flows into another and they love the sea. Two butterflies, sun-kissed, both dart and dance in ecstasy of nearness. Fleetingly, they've reached communion, passion's deepest trance. And even humble atoms that I sense within my very flesh will spin and glow, attracted to a neighbor or the sun. Amazing, Marguerite, what I now know, as students of our separation's pain, it's not how long, it's seeing you again. And then finally, and speaking once again of the young man, Carol's uh, fifth novel, it's called The Sonnet Lover, it was published about 10 years ago. And in that, um, oh, okay, so the poet there is not uh, well used. It's Ginevra Delora. And Ginevra Delora is an Italian woman poet of the late 1500s who has some very distant similarities to uh, the, Fre the actual French sonnet writer Lu Louise LeBay, who lived around that time. But uh, Ginevra Delora. It suggested, might be, uh, not the young man, but the dark lady. So now you've got in these books, you've got the entire, uh, you know, mysteries of uh, William Shakespeare's actual personal passion, which have intrigued and puzzled people for centuries. You know, the answers are revealed, but you know, it will take a while for them to be accepted. But uh, Ginevra de Laura is a. Um, you know, she, she uh, has all the travails of a woman uh, in that society at that time, and um, this poem is related to, um, you know, probably one of the worst ones. It's called Love's Perfect Rose. I long for thee more than the wind can know, more desperately than roses for the sun. I crave the grace thy kisses can bestow upon my lips and much scarred flesh and bone. My violation was no fault of mine. My low-born fate turned woeful in this bed, in contradiction of divine design. My blood announced my anguish as I fled, but on these very stairs, one street with shame, the trail of petal starts and leads up to our destiny to merge. Pink wisps proclaim perfection greater than what Adam knew. For blood is fleeting, but love's perfect rose blooms from eternity as sunlight goes. Okay, so that wraps up the narrative. Um, thank you very much. And, um, I, will, I will turn over the poet to the brilliant poet, Ginger Sanders. You're embarrassing me.